The poem For My Grandmother Knitting by Liz Lockhead asks us to consider the way that elderly people are treated in our society and it deals with this theme of the mistreatment of elderly people. The poet uses the symbol of the grandmother's hands to emphasise her changing roles over the course of her life as she grows from a young fisher girl to an aged old lady. The poem is written from the grandmother's point of view and the main image in the poem is that of the grandmother's hands, as we will come to see. The first stanza opens with a refrain which is, there is no need, they say. Now this is a refrain because it appears in every stanza of the poem. It reinforces a key theme of the poem, that of the grandmother's increasing sense of uselessness. In the eyes of her children, she is useless and there is no need for her to knit and in a way, no need for her to really exist. However, the effect of the repetition of this phrase causes us as readers to doubt this assertion and we wonder perhaps if there is a need for her to knit. Now, there is almost something defiant in the line that follows, which is, but the needle still move. There is in these lines a sense of defiance, despite being told that there is no need for her to knit, she continues to knit and defies what she's being advised. She continues to knit and she continues to find a purpose in her knitting. This line is also an example of personification. It is, almost, it is almost as if the needles themselves are moving and her hands are just moving instinctively. Here, the needles almost have a life of their own. It is also in the stanza that the central image of the grandmother's hands is introduced. What's interesting about this line also is that the word but appears and this word appears this word appears uh, throughout the poem and is a word of defiance as well despite being told there is no need the but here indicates that there perhaps may be a need what they fail to grasp is that her need to knit stems from her need to have purpose and feel useful so in a way by knitting she is trying to in her own kind of way, find a purpose in what she's doing and this is why she knits and this is why she defies what she's being told. Almost seamlessly, aided perhaps by the continuation of one long sentence, these same hands are then transported back to her past when we learn that she was once a fisher girl who was sure and skillful. This example of sibilance here indicates that she once held a role which was a lot different from someone who only knits. She was once a fisher girl. And there's a contrast created here with the sibilance here and um, this idea that she's knitting between the life she had before and the life she has now. The next stanza then opens with the direct assertion that the grandmother is old and that her grasp of things is not so good. She's told, you are old now, and your grasp of things is not so good. Now, this word grasp here has a dual meaning. And the reason I mention this is because it can mean two different things. First of all, first of all, it can mean that in terms of her hands, she cannot hold on to things physically as well as she used to in the past. There is also a second meaning of this word as well. And what we can say is that this word also means that her mental grasp of things is not as good as it once was. However, Lockhead immediately contrasts this image of this useless old person this elderly grandmother, with the girl that she was in her youth. 
Now, the assonance here and the alliteration here in this line whereby we read that you slit the still ticking quicksilver fish helps to emphasize the dexterity of her grandmother's hands when she was young. She was very quick and very good with her hands. So we get this idea that at one point she was very skillful, very quick with her hands. She could kill a fish while it was still moving. In her youth, her hands were her livelihood, but now she only knits out of necessity. In her youth, her hands allowed her to provide for herself, to provide for her family. But now, she only knits, and it's hard work, out of necessity. And this emphasizes her increasing sense of uselessness in this last two lines of this stanza. This idea of necessity is emphasized in the opening of stanza 3. We again get this assertion and it alludes back to the first line of the poem, but now they say there is no need. We did say this is a refrain that will appear over and over to give us this idea that the grandmother is increasingly feeling useless. The poem then leads us back to her youth, the time when she was a young bride with a handspan waist. So despite her tiny frame, we get a contrast because despite her tiny frame, she was able to be a miner's wife who scrubbed his back with her hands in a tin bath by the coal fire. She was a mother of six who scraped, slaved and slapped sometimes when necessary. Now this last line here, scraped, slaved and slapped, is an example of sibilance. The S creating um, a soft sound to indicate that she lived an ordinary life, suffering all the hardships a normal working uh, woman would have at the time. And all of these things, being a miner's wife, despite having a tiny frame, being a bride, being a mother of six, scrubbing her husband's back, all of this she did with her hands. And here, the writer invites us to compare the past with the present. The life that she lived before and the life that she lives now was very different. And the writer here asks us to appreciate this and to take it into account because her children are not. They are only looking at her when she's old. Now, the next stanza is given over entirely to the point of view of the grandmother's own children. The continued refrain appears again, but now they say there is no need. Only, and it again only highlights just how little they think of her. What's interesting is that they mention all the things here in, I guess you could say, in a rather selfish way. All the comments here are based on their own needs and desires. They say they have too much to wear. They say they have more than they can wear. They, they say they have too many scarves and too many cardigans. Of course, what they fail to grasp and what they fail to understand is that by making these scarves and cardigans, even though they may be too many, she's trying to find a purpose in her life. As the poem nears its conclusion, the poet's grandmother is depicted waving goodbye on a Sunday with her painful hands, big on shrunken wrists. Again, this stanza emphasizes now her old age. We really get a vivid image of her old hands. The meter of the poem changes as well from the long sentences of the previous stanzas to much shorter ones. We get powerful adjectives, single adjective sentences, which really force the reader to confront the cruelty of the aging process.
So we have these words here. Swollen jointed, red, arthritic, old. In a way, these words are not only used to indicate her hands, but also her physical state. It is her who is swollen jointed, her who is red, arthritic, and her who is old. This, aspect, this part of the stanza really forces us to think about the aging process. And in a way, these words can be used to describe the way that she is viewed by her own children. The pessimistic note here is relieved in some way by the final lines of the poem, beginning with the lines, but the needle still move. Despite all of this, she continues to be defined. She continues to find a purpose. Easily. She's been working for so long with her hands that in a way it is almost as if her hands had forgotten how to stop. And this is a credit to her. She continues to find a purpose despite her old age, despite having swollen jointed red arthritic old hands which are big and shrunken wrists despite her hands being painful she continues to find a purpose what's unfortunate is that her own children do not understand this and that is how the poem ends